In order to recreate that cinema experience at home, you need a great subwoofer. And great subwoofers can cost hundreds, even thousands of dollars. In this video, I'm going to show you how I built a subwoofer for much less than that that I think can compete on that level. Welcome to another video. On this channel, I like to do it myself. I share with you the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. And if that's something that you need in your feed, consider subscribing. And if you do, don't forget to hit that notification bell so you won't miss a video when it comes out. Now, I do want to tell you, I did not design this subwoofer. It was actually designed by Steven Smith from Home Theater Gurus. He has a great YouTube channel. I'll link it up in the description below. And I'll also link up all of the items that I'm using for this build, as well as a cost list so you can see exactly how much the subwoofer cost. We've got a lot of ground to cover because I'm going to show you construct finishing, REW measurements, as well as some demos at the end. So I want to jump into it, but I'm going to give you some timestamps right here so that if you want to jump to a certain point in the video at any time, you can either do that or I'll also put timestamps down in the description. I am going to run through this pretty quick, so if you have any questions or anything as you watch the video, just leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to answer your question. Now, just for my own purposes, I did model this subwoofer in SketchUp, and you can go out there, I actually uploaded it into the 3D warehouse, so you can actually go out there and take a look at it. I did a couple of different options for cut sheets, and one of those cut sheet options was basically breaking down the MDF, because it can be somewhat unwieldy. I just modified the original cut sheet that Steven had created and uh, made it into a half sheet system where you can cut parts out of half a sheet and then move on to the other half sheet and cut the parts out. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm measuring basically the half of the sheet. I'm using a clamping straight edge and unfortunately I did not check my battery before I started cutting and so I had an issue where I had to replace the battery. And then I never trust the edge of the factory edge. I always cut the first piece a little bit large and then move the fence and cut it down to size. While you have your fence set at the 15 and a half inches, don't forget to cut your piece of plywood for the inner baffle. And then my build is a little bit different than Steven's in that I'm using plywood for some of the exterior panels. And one of the things about plywood is that you want to make sure you minimize the tear out whenever you do a cross cut that I'm doing here. And the way I've avoided that is by putting some painter's tape on there and putting that down and pressing it in really tightly before I measure and cut the piece. And that actually helps minimize tear out. And so I'll do that and then actually cut through the tape whenever I cut the board. And I should have moved the fence before I did that because I ran into the fence. But then here I'm cutting the side pieces. And you notice the board is a little bit warped. And that's something I have to address a little bit later on in the video. But not a huge ordeal. Um, using a miter sled there. And that is really a great piece of equipment. I made that myself. And there you can see the benefits of using the tape on the rip cut. And every time I'm doing a rip cut for length, you can see that with the MDF, you really don't need it. And I am mocking up or fitting together everything as I go along just to make sure that everything fits properly and make sure that there's no issues. And I've got it clamped together so we can kind of see there's some braces in the front of the port. Everything is pretty well lined up. I, I wasn't too worried about it. I just want to make sure everything fit and that everything was looking good and going together. So there's another view of the port. Now, in that night, Whenever I got done mocking everything up, I realized I should have glued the front and back panel together. So about 9 o'clock at night, I went out and glued that together. And it was ready the next day. So here I'm using a rabbit bit to cut the subwoofer port or the hole out for the subwoofer. And unfortunately, when I got done with that, I was using the roto zip and I had to change the bit out once because it broke when I was in the middle of trying to cut all the way through the two pieces for the bottom part of the basket. And I thought I would use a real cool technique of using tape and glue, but apparently uh, you have to use the acetate glue in order to make that work. So that didn't work real well. Um, I suggest definitely taking a test piece and cutting your chamfers or your, your edges on that before you use your actual piece. And I did something a little bit different here than what Steven did in his. I actually chamfered or rounded off the edges of the, the bottom port where they're inside of the box just to make sure that there's no sharp edges or anything to cause any chuffing or anything like that. Here is the port brace and I probably spent way too much time on that trying to make it perfect and everything because I had some other issues as I was going along doing the cuts on it. But my idea was to create four squares and then do some holes in the squares and then what I would do is take the roto zip with the straight edge and actually run it along all of the sides so that I could get a nice clean cut 
and uh, getting all those holes drilled in here. It's starting to look like a domino, actually. And once I got done, I went to use the rotor zip, and sure enough, another disaster. My last bit that I had broke, and so I wound up using my jigsaw, which it actually broke as well. <laughs> and so I wound up having to just use a skill saw, and I used my, uh, it's like an oscillating cutter I used for that. And then here I'm doing the same process, measuring out, finding the center, and then cutting the opening for the amp in the back. And I'm doing the same thing using a saw this time and then using my oscillating cutter in order to cut out those the rest of the hole there. Now, because I'm using plywood on the sides as well, I'm putting some banding on there or veneer. And so I learned a pretty cool technique online when I was looking at doing this. You can actually take a file to trim rather than using a cutter or a razor blade on there. And it seemed to be a lot better to me because I've, I've had some issues with using a razor blade where I've actually dipped into the veneer on the outside of the plywood. So that technique worked really well. And here I'm putting the lower port brace in and just trying to make sure that it's all even and that's got plenty of room at the back and you know everything is lined up properly. Probably spending a little bit more time on this than what I have to, but I just want to make sure everything is as good as possible and everything looks great. Uh, I am using some brad nails and I'm using inch and a half nails for it. And uh, there I just scribed a line along the bottom to be able to put the nails in. Now for the plywood, I'm using wood glue on the bottom and then because it was warped like I was talking about, I'm actually using some clamps and then I'm using a, a spare piece of wood or a, a cut off piece of wood to kind of tap back and forth. And it works really well because you can use it kind of as a guide as you're tapping it along. And then I also brad nailed the bottom together. Uh, here I'm pre-painting the bottom part of the port. Hindsight, I probably should have not put paint on top so I could put some glue on there, but honestly I haven't had any rattles or anything like that since I've had it together. So here I am trying to make sure everything is perfect again, make sure all the seams and gaps and all that stuff are as perfect as possible, and uh, using some brad nails on there as well. I did nail down the center, and I had to come around the front side because I wasn't sure exactly where that ended. Now, here's where I'm starting to use the PL3, and I put a bunch of that on the bottom of those two panels together, and some of it oozed out into the port, so I had to wind up wiping all that off. And then uh, I made the baffle on the front where the subwoofer goes a little bit proud or sticking out just a little bit past the plywood just so that I could be able to sand that all down. Um, and then I used the PL3 on the brace inside as well, kind of stuck it in there at an angle and then kind of squished it back through there. And for that, actually, because the PL3 is such a mess in there, I didn't use a square. I actually wound up just measuring the brace to the back of the subwoofer cabinet. Here I am installing the rear panel for... The amplifier plate and then what i did with the pl3 was i went around inside and actually glued everything all together and kind of sealed up everything as i went along and then that was basically the end of the first day of building it and there's everything assembled without the clamps i've got nails in it and everything it's, it's starting to take shape and then the next morning i came out and started using the pl3 again i used pl3 and wood glue on the top panel because i wanted to make sure that it was glued really tight where it butted up against the other wood where the veneer was so i kind of made a little bit of a combo glue there and you can see where it kind of squished out which is fine that's what i wanted and then up here i wanted to make sure that the top was flush as possible with the sides and so i, I kind of raised it up in the front because i knew i was going to be putting some filler in there anyways and there I'm clamping the back portion down because of the fact that it was a little bit warped, but I, it came out fine. It wasn't a huge issue. And uh, I'm kind of wiping all the PL3 around and making sure everything is nice and sealed off and making sure that everything is good. Here I'm using some wood filler to fill all the nail holes that I did. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't fill up too much of the wood grain with this. So I'm trying to keep it as small as possible. Now, because the, pan the front and rear panel were a little bit proud or sticking out a little bit, I used some pretty aggressive sandpaper to try to bring those down to the level of the plywood. And I used some plastic wood, which is a wood filler. I was trying to fill the grain on the front and rear panel areas, and it just did not work very well. I couldn't get it to come out of the tube. I wound up at one point just taking a razor blade and cutting the tube open, and that's kind of what you're seeing there where I'm just smearing it on. It did fill a little bit, but I just, it did not work as, as well as I had wanted it to. So I had to try something else on that. Now here I'm putting some gray primer on. I did use an automotive primer. I'll link everything up in the description that I used on this so that you can see exactly what I used. I used an automotive gray primer and I'm just putting a, just kind of a seal coat on and it's not a bad idea to do some cross hatching, go one way and then go back the other way. Now, one of the things that I did try to do was seal up the plywood with some 
like five minute epoxy and that was a disaster here i'm sanding all of it back off because it just was a gummy gooey mess it never did really harden up i mean i left it for a full 24 hours and it never did uh, harden up so i mean i, I kind of made a big mistake on that with the front and the rear panel as you'll see here in just a second it was it really was a gooey mess on the back too and so I had to wind up sanding all that back off. So let that be a cautionary tale. Don't use that for your your ceiling on the back. Now here I'm using a black primer. And I like to alternate colors of primer whenever I do priming. And the reason being is so that whenever you are sanding, if you hit your primary color your or your first color, then you know you need to stop. I mean, just like when you, if you're going to fill a hole in your yard, you don't dig your yard around to, to be the level of everything else or, or to be the level of the hole you're gonna fill it in. And so that's kind of what the idea is with the primer. Now this primer was not the most ideal. I wanted to use it because I wanted to make sure that it was something accessible to all of you, but I wound up using probably five or six pieces of sandpaper on every single panel as I went along. It just was gumming up really bad. And uh, make sure you blow off your surface before you go to prime it again. And here I'm using the black primer just so I can use kind of a, a two colored primer like I had talked about before. And you'll see a little bit later on whenever I go to sand everything, you'll see that some of that gray primer starts to show through and that's a good indicator to stop. Now here's the back panel after I primed it one time and I'm doing the same thing with the front. You can start to see some of that gray primer showing through the front. And I went to Bondo, which is like a automotive filler and it does work pretty well. You just mix it up with the hardener and then I'm using a, a pretty straight flat edge to push it in. And you want to put quite a bit of force and push it into all of your little gaps and any kind of pinholes or any seams or anything like that. There I'm putting another coat of primer on. And this is kind of a theme, prime, sand, prime. <laughs> I mean, it's what you got to do in order to make the surfaces work. And here is the back panel after I put the Bondo on there. I'm sanding it off. And it's not quite as bad as the primer with eating sandpaper disc, but it certainly did eat up some sandpaper and so i'm putting another coat of primer on just like i said sand prime sand same type of thing now i'm going to use a center punch for marking the holes for the amp in the back because i'll drill those i want to drill those before i actually paint it to make sure that everything is in the right place and so there i'm just using a, a small drill to drill pilot holes for the screws to go in for the amplifier I'm do the same thing with the subwoofer i did use a couple of zip ties to be able to move it and hold it move it around there. I'm just drilling holes in there. I didn't drill holes all the way through to the plywood. I just barely hit the plywood. I wanted to give plenty of meat or plenty of plywood for the screws to grab onto. And one of the things I suggest doing if you're going to do it with a rattle can like I did or spray paint like I did, get yourself one of the handles that you can use with the Rust-Oleum cans. They're only a couple bucks and really they really save the fatigue on your, your fingers and your wrist and all that stuff. And I'm using a tack cloth and you can find those either in your big box like Home Depot, Lowe's, just look for a tack cloth. You can also get them at automotive stores and that's something that will actually help remove any kind of dust or dirt from the surface before you go to do the painting and it's going to keep a lot of dirt and stuff out of your paint. And I even though I painted it outside it, it does work really well. I even wound up using the tack rag on the inside of the box just to make sure that there were no dust particles that were going to come flying out. Now here I'm actually slowing the video down so you can see how quickly I'm moving. Um, you know, I'm not holding down the trigger on it. And whenever I do the sides and the top or the plywood, I'm wanting the surface to be really nice and smooth. You want to move really fast and overlap as much as possible. Um, you know, probably more than 50%, but move quickly so that the paint doesn't pile up on the surface. That's one of the things that I see that people do a lot is they move too slow. And when you do that, it actually piles the paint up and you can have some runs. I didn't have any runs with this uh, build at all. I didn't have any runs in the surface or the finish. And you can kind of see as I'm moving along there, it's starting to shine and starting to shine up. But this is basically just a tack coat. And that's what you're going to want to spray when you first start spraying these things. Or if you're doing something like this, spray a tack coat so that, you know, it'll get good adhesion. And then it gives you a good base to work on from there. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm just getting the light coat on there just to make sure that everything is, is somewhat covered and kind of tacking up the surface. And I'm going to speed up the video here so that uh, we're not watching me spray this thing the whole time. Now, I waited about probably 10 or 15 minutes between coats. And I did come back here and coat recoat that just a little bit because I could tell it was starting to dry a little bit uh, because it was a tack coat. It wasn't a lot of material on there. But I actually waited about 15 minutes between the next two coats. 
And that's one of the things you need to do. You got to make sure you let it flash off or let it dry enough for it to be able to not run and not let the paint pile up on there where you're going to get a lot of uh, material on there. And that can cause runs and, and, you know, it makes the surface stay tackier for longer, which would give you susceptibility to getting bugs or dirt or whatever into it. And I'm just, you know, I, I did speed the video up here, so you're not seeing the, the wait time in between, but I'm going through and, and making sure that everything is nice and covered. Now here I'm using some polyfill for the inside. I couldn't find any blue jean material. I, that stuff was scarce when I was building this thing. I did find some one inch, but I didn't really think it was enough. So I used some polyfill sheets as well as the one inch blue jean or denim material and or cotton, whichever it is. And then I'm using the PL77 to adhere it to the inside of the box. And I did it throughout the entire box. Now here I'm soldering extensions onto the cables that came with the amplifier and I used 14 gauge that's what came on it and I don't I don't see any issue with using 14 gauge it's a very short run and I did use heat shrink tubing to protect those soldered connections. I put stainless steel screws in the back where the amplifier is and it has its own seal so there's no reason to add any type of a seal to it and I did go around and have to tighten them up a little bit at a time just to make sure everything was was down. Now I ran the the subwoofer in series and that means basically you're going to put positive to one side and negative to the other side and then run your your wires positive to negative on either side and here i am installing the subwoofer and getting everything tightened up it does have its own seal on it as well and we are pretty much done with it so let's have a look at the finished product All right, so let's take a look at the uh, REW, and I did get full compression, and I believe, if I remember correctly, my receiver, my Marantz uh, SR6014, was at mm, positive 10, I believe it was, and one of the reasons I think for that is I had to wind up turning this subwoofer way down. I've got two subs. I've got a cheap Dayton 1500, uh, like $199 sub that I bought when I started on this uh, home theater journey, and it's not the greatest in the world, but... Uh, it does help out. As you can see, I have a null right at about 42, uh, 42 hertz, something like that. And uh, I'll show you here in just a second the graph with both of them together. But that is just a sub by itself. Uh, it is EQ'd with mini DSP using REW, which I'm showing here. And I did time align it and match it with the other sub. So let's take a look at the response with both subs so you can kind of see. And this is, I mean, really, if you are thinking about one sub you should probably think about two subs because of the fact that it really does smooth the response out and we'll take a look at the second sub added in and the response with both of them together is actually fairly good even though that's a cheap sub it does help fill in that hole around the 42 43 hertz mark and i'm pretty happy with the response that i'm getting i can't wait to get the second one in there i'm actually building a second one so this should be a lot of fun. All right, so everybody always wants to see some demos. So I'm going to show you a couple different ones. So I'll put the demo name up on the screen. I'm not showing any video or any high frequencies just because I don't want to be demonetized or get some kind of copyright strike or anything like that. So Blade Runner 2049, Ready Player One, and Edge of Tomorrow. So let's check out those demos.
Well, I have to say I'm very, very happy with the subwoofer. The REW measurement really doesn't tell the whole story, in my opinion. This thing shakes the couch like crazy, and it makes the house and the walls rattle. <laughs> it's, it's pretty awesome. I, I, I enjoy it a lot. So much so that I'm actually building another one. And I would actually love to put this thing up against a couple of SVS subwoofers, maybe the 3000 or the 4000 SVS if you're watching. Give me a call. <laughs> but uh, if you guys are interested, I'll show you whenever I build the second subwoofer, I'll show you how I'm how to gain match, how I time align them, and how I try to get the best out of both of the subwoofers in my room using the Mini, S Mini DSP 2x4 HD and the U-Mic 1 along with REW and all the other tools that we have at our disposal in the home theater market. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. I certainly do appreciate that. Share it out there if somebody is uh, thinking about building a subwoofer that you think this might help. I want to say thanks again to Steven Smith for all of his help throughout the process. I've talked to him through email and numerous conversations, and I certainly do appreciate his help. And go check him out. I'll leave a link in the description down below. This has been Brian for Build It With Brian. We'll see you on the next video.